Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Angela Linto. I'm a colleague and friend of James W. Cronin, a very special man whose work and life we celebrate today. Thank you for joining us. It means a lot to us that so many of you came from so far away in this all through the planet to share in this very sad moment our great memories of a very special person whose life and work transformed our view of nature. Jim was a brilliant physicist, a visionary, and a charismatic leader who inspired us all to continue his deep dialogue with nature, with a capital N. I will now, um, with further ado, invite President Zimmer to make a few, uh, to give us a few words. Thank you. Uh, good morning, and let me add my welcome uh, formally on behalf of the entire University of Chicago to that of Angela, uh, to this ceremony in which we celebrate the life and work of Jim Cronin. Uh, I knew Jim for many years, although many of you uh, here today knew Jim uh, better personally than I did, as family members, uh, close friends, collaborators, and colleagues. Uh, so I'll just say a few words about my personal experience with Jim, but I do want to open with some words in my capacity as president of the university. Those of us at the university are fortunate to live and work in an extremely unusual environment. The history and the present of the university are ones of enormous and exciting discovery and inventiveness. It's all around us, and uh, most of our faculty and students are constantly contributing to this energy. But in all of this activity, there are a few individuals who become not just wonderful contributors to the university, but because of who they are and the nature of their work and contributions, come to help define the university, what it means and what it stands for. Uh, Jim Cronin was such a person. While all great science gets absorbed quickly in the next generation's thinking and in some sense becomes almost normal understanding, at least common understanding, it's quite astonishing to reflect upon Jim Cronin's contributions to such a remarkably fundamental understanding of the nature of the universe. But it is not only such fundamental contributions that were so remarkable about Jim, but his determination to close that chapter, change the direction, and to approach a different domain in physics with a similar level of boldness and audacity that was quite breathtaking to watch. In all of this work, in its depth, in its commitment to science, in its risk-taking and boldness, Jim embodied the highest aspirations of the University of Chicago, and he became an indelibly visible highlight of its history. On a more personal note, I vividly remember a conversation that Jim and I had at a dinner in which we sat next to each other. It was a wide-ranging conversation that we had, uh, as we enjoyed food and uh, perhaps a bit too much drink. It led us, frankly, to discussions about aging and mortality. And Jim said at that point that he knew he couldn't live for another hundred years, and that was okay. He didn't mind that. Uh, but he just wished that he could know what was going to happen over that time and what people would understand then. He didn't need to be there, but he just wished that he could know. And to me, this was the expression of an individual driven by more than a desire, but a need to know and to understand. And it drove him to do extraordinary work over his whole life. All of us at the university miss Jim Cronin now and will continue to do so. He will always be remembered at the University of Chicago as a defining figure of his generation. Now I'll ask Lawrence Curtis to join us. Lawrence uh, grew up with Jim, and he calls him Jimmy. So if he's talking about Jimmy, you know who he's talking about. Thank you, Angela. Um, all of yesterday, and continuing today, we've heard so much about Jim Cronin and the world of physics. He obviously uh, made that world. He would not want me to say that. He helped make it. And he contributed considerably. And he's been honored for that. It's amazing the different uh, areas that were covered just yesterday 
in the papers that were given. I want to tell you, though, about a different world of Jim Cronin. And it was a world that uh, was, I think I was fortunate, because when I met Jimmy, Jim, <laughs> Uh, it was uh, in 1945. He was 14. I was 15. We were teenagers. And uh, we were both in high school together. This, I think, was the beginning, I guess, the uh, conception of much of what we heard yesterday because he was already deep in his world of physics. Now, we both had a tremendous curiosity for the, uh, nature, for the natural world. He, in his physics work, me as a zoologist. We both pursued it. And we, uh, in, in my old, own field, I did an awful lot of zoological field work. It was very simple <clears throat> to get Jim to come as a partner. He loved his laboratory. He loved to spend time at the physics lab. But the minute there was an opportunity to go somewhere, I think I mentioned this yesterday on seeing the meteor shower, which uh, he, when I told him about the Fort Davis and the McDonald Observatory, his response was, when do we leave? He did not hesitate a minute. We went throughout the state of Texas studying the plants, the animals, uh, the environment, and um, we really worked up some ecologies of each of our biotic provinces. We did this for several years, and uh, it was delightful. Jimmy was a great companion, and he always, though, asked questions about what was we were looking at, what was happening, why was this, why was that. Um, the, uh, uh, at that time, I was, had a weekend job at a, a public aquarium, the Dallas Aquarium, and I would be out there every weekend. Jimmy would join me. My duties were very mundane, and we would experiment with various things. Uh, we, uh, Jimmy was loved to quantify what I was studying, natural history. Very difficult sometimes, but he could always, the minute he could measure it, that was great. We got in two electric eels once. Two, one was uh, about three feet long. We called that one Kilo. The other one was about six feet long. That was Watt. Now Watt, you'd think would be, uh, you know, the, the higher voltage. He was about, at best, 150 to 200 volts. The little three-footer, Kilo, he was running 600 volts. So uh, this is a problem of age, but don't worry about it. It'll get you. Now, we made measurements of those eels, and uh, you have to understand the nature of them. The head of the electric eel is positive, electrically positive. The tail is electrically negative. And when they release this discharge, it's three different charges. One of them is for killing their prey, which they can adjust to fit the size of the prey. A big, they love fish, to eat fish. A big fish would get so many, maybe three or 400 volts. A smaller fish, just a little bit. And they can control that. We were, we were making observations of all of this. The literature on these fish was very limited. We had copies of all of it, and um, Jimmy especially loved the physics, and uh, we would uh, uh, get measurements as we went. They also have a discharge called, it's like radar, and they're, when they put that out, it's like blip, 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 and then when they find a, a fish, they're going to zero in on blip, 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 and then they would give the killing discharge, which big explosion on the amplifier. So we did this a lot, and we were writing a paper on it. Now, you have to remember, now Jimmy at that time was 17, I was 18. We were just, we weren't nerds. Um, we, 
in the strictest sense we weren't. <clears throat> I mean, we liked girls, and um, we would often take them on our field trips, but out of deference to Carol, I have to be very careful there. But we, we were gentlemen, and, but we wanted, wanted to study the environment, in my case, the natural environment, in Jimmy's case, all of his physical phenomena. And uh, it was much, it was great. So uh, we had, uh, were writing this article, and one night we had, I guess we had, it was Saturday night, and we up till midnight getting measurements on the rate <clears throat> at which this electric discharge, <clears throat> it went back from the head to the tail as an electrical wave ranging in voltage as it went. And uh, we were, I would, was operating the uh, oscilloscope and Jimmy would put the, uh, the, the positive electrode on the eel's nose and then move it down 10, millimeter, 10 centimeters and then get a measurement and then another and another until we got to the tail. Well, he had an awful lot of data. And as you know, those of you who worked with him, you know that he needed figures. He needed quantification, proof. So this went on, and uh, we got through about midnight, went home, about 2 o'clock. I lived in a, near the, in a, had a little habitat in the garage. I had to escape my older brother. And so the call came at 2 in the morning. My mother answered the phone, and oh no, I'll go get him. He is in here. I, where, where is he? Oh, he's back in the. Oh yes. Okay, just a so she got me. Jim Cronin wants you. What's happened? Has there been an accident? Are the police involved? What have you done now? Now that's the worst thing you can ask a teenager. I said, oh. So Jim says, very excited, very excited. He said, I've got all those measurements now. I've run them, I've run them three times, and I, I'm sure I've made a mistake, but there's something, I've got to re make some more measurements. I, I, I'm really working on this. You come pick me up in the morning. Next morning I pick him up. Jim, and we stop for some coffee. Jim, what is he, what is it, why are you so excited? And he said, well, he was deflated now. Completely, he'd lost it all. He was not excited, but he still wanted to get more measurements. Well, what, what's the problem? Well, I made a mistake in my computations. A, a simple mistake. You see, we had, he used a slide rule. We didn't have computers. Then. We didn't have things like that. They didn't take batteries, just the slide rule. And he could operate a slide rule faster than any of the professors in the physics department. So he said, well, Here's what I got, and I thought my measurements indicated that the, when that eel made that discharge, when the, the small one did, and got to the tail, that it went faster than the speed of light. <laughs> now, by the way, the title of this essay, I've written an essay, when Jim died, I go into depression. I um, start introspecting my life with Cronin and what we'd done. And I'm still writing on it. And as soon as I finish it, I'm going to give it to our chair, chairwoman. Where is, there you are, Angela, hiding in the back. And um, I'll, I'm going to write, that's the title of my essay, by the way. Um, Right after he told me that, we did go to the aquarium. We made some more measurements. And in the process, uh, he was operating the electrode. I was on the oscilloscope. And uh, we wear, wore rubber gloves. The eels are in the water. And the gloves came up to about here. And if you weren't, you know, you had to keep them dry. You keep your hands dry. Well, a little water went into one of the gloves, and this was the big, the, the, the middle, the small eel that put out the big electricity. It just gave him a hell of a wallop. He jumped, 
he almost knocked over the oscilloscope. And I said, Jim, are you okay? Are you okay? Yeah, but is the oscilloscope okay? He was more <laughs> concerned with that. And I said, you know, Jim, you jumped faster than the speed of light. <laughs> he never let me forget that. The last time I was here visiting with Jim, we, uh, I had just gotten a new aortic valve. He had just gotten a new knee. We were both cripples. And, but we were going to go look to the Millennial Park. Well, he took this circuitous route. And on the halfway mark about, we passed this bar. And I said, let's have a glass of wine. Okay. So we were in there drinking. And he says, Curtis, you know we've come a long way but we're not going faster than the speed of light now. <laughs> he says, let's have another glass. We've got to recharge our batteries. Let's have another glass of wine. Same thing on the way back. We found our way back. Um, in closing, I would like to add something that my new friend, David Boratov, uh, hit on last night when he was talking about Jim. This concerns the Cronin effect. Now, you physicists explain that over and over again about the Cronin effect, and it certainly it seems to be an established phenomenon of the new science of physics. Uh, and that's real. But I want to suggest that there may be two Cronin effects. And I think that the ones that we are hearing, I've heard so many different definitions now and descriptions of Jim Cronin. He's unassuming. He's um, uh, charismatic a while ago. You also said something else. He's, uh, anyway, uh, many, many definitions talking about Jim Cronin. I would suggest this, that that is the Cronin effect. And in a word, it's greatness. Not great, greatness. I think he personified it. And I would suggest to the physicists that if you'll accept a simple zoologist analysis of all this, that there's two effects. There's a, a, a primary Cronin effect, which I've just described, and there is a secondary effect. I happen to be in, thankfully, on the development of that first Cronin effect. And I believe me, I'm so happy that I was able to spend 70 years knowing Jim Cronin. The other effect, obviously, is established. That may be effect, the secondary effect. But the primary effect, I think, as evidenced here, produce the secondary effect. Thank you so much for putting up with me, a zoologist.
Members of the family, President Zimmer, honored guests and friends, I had the good fortune to know Jim Cronin as a mentor, as a colleague, and above all, as a friend. In the fall of 1965, I went to Princeton as an enthusiastic new graduate student in physics, excited about starting a new phase in my life. I knew very well the remarkable results on CP violation that Jim and his three collaborators had discovered the year before. It had rocked the physics world. At Princeton, I quickly made contact with Jim, who was restarting his research program after spending a year in France. So began an association with Jim, which was to last many decades. It was to shape my appreciation of physics, my connections to colleagues, and indeed my entire life. In those days, Jim organized a meeting of his research group each week, but instead of a conference room at the lab, it was held in his home in the evening. There was a chalkboard in the living room and coffee and cookies prepared by Annette in the dining room. For young graduate students far from home, it was a warm and welcoming environment, and physics became a personal thing. Jim was generally soft-spoken and led by example. I came to realize that while creativity and insight were important, often a lot of hard work was needed to make the experiment successful. Sometimes compromises needed to be made, but at the same time, the critical issues had to be kept in mind. I remember building the heavy steel spark chambers needed for my thesis experiment at the Princeton Penn Accelerator. A technical crew might have done the work, but instead the physics team organized two-person shifts to get the job done in a timely way. I remember working with Jim late one Saturday afternoon in a deserted assembly hall at the PPA, lifting steel plates, cleaning them with alcohol, and all the time talking physics. The physics team was small in those days. When we came to operate the experiment, there were just five of us, and we operated 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Jim had teaching as well as faculty responsibilities, but he took shifts with the rest of us. This led to a tremendous esprit de corps. It was a small team. We had utter confidence in each other, and we really owned that experiment. After a few years, I finished my thesis and left Princeton for a few years at CERN and Harvard. There, the work went well. I learned different experimental techniques and different styles of operation. At about this time, the machine at the National Accelerator Laboratory, what we now call Fermilab, was about to come into operation. During, during this period, I was surprised to learn that Jim had moved from that idyllic place in New Jersey to the University of Chicago. He wanted to have access to a world-class facility close to home. I think he may have also seen Chicago as an opportunity to start something new. When he asked me if I'd be interested in joining him, I jumped at the chance. While I never worked with him directly on one of his experiments at Chicago, I was still proud to be a member of the new high energy physics group at Chicago. We were very close knit. Six or eight of us all had lunch together every day. We shared in our, the latest developments of our own work, as well as news from the wider community. Jim organized new seminar series, invited many visitors. He organized common funding for the team of several faculty members working on several experiments. And this meant that the junior members of the group never had to worry about chasing funding and the resources could be efficiently used it also lent stability to our technical group. Jim was always the guiding hand with vision, good sense, and humanity. While there are many good stories from those days, such as when Bob Sachs, the director of the Enrico Fermi Institute, had to get Jim out of jail because he didn't have an Illinois driver's license, I want to remember instead a personal story which exemplifies Jim. My wife also worked with Jim and one Friday afternoon, she was feeling blue, far from home and from friends, and with me usually at Fermilab. Jim must have overheard her talking to his secretary next to his office, because at a certain point, he called me into his office, told me something had just come up. 
he couldn't possibly use the opera tickets he had, and that I should take Carla to the opera. That night we enjoyed La Traviata at the Lyric, and the world was a little better for both of us for a while. Things moved fast in high-energy physics in those days. New effects were being uncovered, and the dynamic quark model was being revealed. At the same time, other aspects of high-energy physics were being clarified. A lot of students and young people were part of the Chicago team and the process. Jim was always careful that the young people had the opportunity to show their talents and to make decisions and to carry their ideas to completion. On occasion, he even stepped aside from experiments in order not to overshadow a junior colleague. He felt it part of his responsibility not only to train people, but to help them take their next professional steps. Jim was always motivated by major scientific questions and sought ways he could make a difference. In the early 1980s, unusual effects were observed in several astrophysics experiments on cosmic rays. He realized these issues were important and that he could do the measurement much more definitively. This began his turn to astrophysics, first with a small group in Utah and later with a much larger Auger Observatory. Others will touch on these years. I just want to conclude by saying that many of us had our lives deeply influenced by Jim. We will always remember those days and are far better for them. Thank you. I was a junior in college when Jim and Val discovered CP violation. A few months later, I asked my college research supervisor for advice on selecting a graduate school. His response was clear and to the point. There is only one school to attend, he said, Princeton, and two people there to work for, Cronin and Fitch. Fortunately, I was accepted at Princeton, and when I wrote to Jim a few months later, he graciously invited me to join his group. Jim was a wonderful mentor. He taught by example in picking the right problem, in developing a simple yet effective method to attack it, in performing careful and thorough tests of the apparatus, and in carrying out the initial analysis of the data more quickly than anyone else could. Jim provided enormous encouragement, support, and guidance for the young people in his group. This was particularly visible in the weekly evening group meetings we had in Jim's living room. Jim also gave us a great deal of freedom, perhaps on occasion too much freedom. Toward the end of my thesis experiment, Jim and the other senior physicists had to return to Princeton, so the running experiment at Brookhaven was left in the hands of the two graduate students, Bruce Knapp and myself, who were charged with keeping the experiment running and running well. We decided to take 48-hour shifts, spending most of the time lying on an army cot we set up in the counting room, periodically opening our eyes to look at the readout to make sure data was still being accumulated. That went on until one day I returned from lunch to find that the Brookhaven safety group had roped off our army cot with a sign that said, radiation zone, do not enter. As I said, maybe we had a little too much freedom. I, I don't think Jim ever heard what, uh, what had happened that, uh, that day. The support I received was personal as well as professional. A year after I entered graduate school, Sheila and I were married. Jim and Annette were very welcoming. A few years later, after our son was born, the Princeton summer was extremely hot. Jim and Annette were going to be away for an extended period, so they invited us to spend that time in their spacious air-conditioned home rather than our hot, small army barracks apartment. It made for a much more pleasant summer. Jim and Annette's elder daughter, Kathy, was our son's first babysitter. Toward the end of my graduate career, when a new accelerator that would become Fermilab was being designed, Jim told me that he had an idea for an experiment there and asked me to stay on for a few years as a postdoc. His idea was a great example of Jim's style of doing physics. Most of the proposals for experiments were documents one to 200 pages long. The one Jim and Pierre Pirouet submitted was very short proposing to look for energetic particles produced at large angles from the beam. The rationale was simple. Since nothing was expected to be there, anything that was seen would be interesting. 
And did we, indeed, we did see something, and it certainly was interesting. Such particles were produced, and they provided important information about the relatively new picture of protons being made of quarks. Shortly after Jim submitted the proposal, he took a sabbatical year at the new laboratory in Batavia, 50 miles west of here. Six months later, he returned to Princeton for a visit and told me, Chicago has made me an offer I don't think I can turn down. How would you like to do the same thing but do it at Chicago? And that's how we wound up settling in Illinois. Jim's arrival here once again demonstrated his belief that young people provide an essential vitality to a department. In order to attract him, the university and the physics department agreed to substantially increase the number of junior faculty members. In a short period of time, Henry Frisch, Jim Pilcher, Bruce Winstein, Eli Rosenberg, and I were all appointed to the faculty as were a number uh, of young particle theorists, condensed matter physicists, gravitational physicists, and astrophysicists. Jim single-handedly reduced the mean age of the physics faculty by more than a decade. The purpose of Jim coming to Chicago was to be able to easily work at Fermilab, but Jim was always attracted by important physics puzzles. A rare decay mode of the neutral K meson hadn't been seen at the expected rate, so we built an experiment to pursue it at the accelerator at Argonne National Laboratory. Our group wound up simultaneously running experiments at Fermilab and Argonne with every, everyone taking shifts at both labs. For most, the only problem this presented was a bit of exhaustion at times. But for someone as directionally challenged as I am, it presented another problem. On more than one occasion, driving on autopilot while going out to take a midnight shift, I would arrive only to discover I'd driven to the wrong laboratory. Having two simultaneous experiments provided more opportunities and freedom for the younger faculty. And Refresh focused more on the Fermilab experiments and I spent more of my time on the Argon project. They were both successful with the Argon experiment finding the decay at the expected rate, while, the, while at Fermilab a very fruitful series of experiments was carried out in collaboration with Pirouet's Princeton group. And Jim was always careful to give credit to his younger colleagues. As I said, Jim's style was to use the simplest apparatus needed to get to the science. A good example is seen in the name of one of our last Fermilab experiments together, the multi-hole spectrometer. Indeed, we built it by first digging a series of wide, deep cylindrical holes in the ground. Jim Cronin had an enormous impact on my career as a mentor and a friend. He was generous, kind, and always supportive. I'm enormously grateful, and I'm very sad that he is no longer with us. Thank you, Mel, and thank you, Jim. And now an offer from our daughter, Clarice, a piece she calls the last song. She wrote, and she's offering it to the family.
Thank you very much. Emily, your turn to come up and share some words with us. Good morning. First off, on behalf of my entire family, thank you for coming. We've had, we have people from so many different countries and so many areas within the United States. My dad would be very, very pleased. And a special thank you to the University of Chicago and especially Angela, Angela for making the arrangements for this symposium and this lovely day we're having today. As we have heard, and so many of you are aware, my father was passionate about experimental physics and the development of better instrumentation. I don't know if this passion he was born with or developed over years, but what I do know is that my, his mind could break down the single most complex science and make sense of it. Yet, my father had an equal, though seemingly opposite, passion for simplicity in his personal life. He was very much a family man and enjoyed the quiet respite of home. Our home was his sanctuary, where family dinners, books, music, and intellectual curiosity were the cornerstones of our daily life. My father also loved to travel in his cabin in the woods. However, no matter where he was or whom he was with, his strong opinions, wonderful dry sense of humor, and ever-present practicality and innate integrity were a constant reminder of his character and a gift to all of us who got to spend time with him. My most poignant memory of our daily home life is family dinners where the food would be adventurous, my mom was a great cook, and the conversation topical. Frequently, the discussion included my days at the lab, my dad's day at the lab. We, Kathy and I, and then Dan later, would often feign understanding and try and mirror his ever-present enthusiasm for his work. Like the one day, he was absolutely exuberant, holding an 8 by 10 photograph with a black background and with a bright white arc. And he was going on and on, on and on, you guys are going to know this, repeating, isn't this beautiful? Isn't this beautiful? Can't you see how beautiful this is? And we had no, absolutely no clue. And to this day, I think it had to do with a spark chamber. Am I right? Or, not, or not, but don't know. <laughs> um, after dinner, my parents would spend the evenings in the living room often with a fire going. And now I remember all the students there on the blackboard, but I had forgotten that, so thank you. Um, in the evenings, uh, my mom would generally be reading or playing the piano, and my dad would be working on a lap desk that he made out of particle board. My siblings and I would retreat upstairs to do homework and listen to music on headphones, as according to my dad, as according to my dad, uh, Popular music was the decline of the Western civilization. I, I'm serious, that's what he would tell me. Let's see. But when we were upstairs with our headphones on, doing homework, listening to music, we certainly would not watch the TV. My dad, as wonderful as he was, could be a bit headstrong. This probably won't come as a surprise to many of you, as, I've been, as I have been reading, his stubbornness, as frustrating as it could be, also allowed him to question accepted scientific principles, which ultimately led to important advancements in our understanding of the physical world. We certainly were no stranger to this side of his personality at home. Most notable was the issue of the television. For most of my teen years, we had a TV that only worked on Sundays and only when the Chicago Bears were playing. I, I am serious. So let me explain. One day while we were in Princeton, my dad decided that his children spending the afternoons watching the lineup of Hazel, Gilligan's Island, and Bewitched was unacceptable. So the TV disappeared. But curiously, a few years later in Chicago, a TV appeared. However, it was disabled, except for when the Bears were playing. And if the Bears were losing, the TV would become disabled again, and Dad would need to go to the lab. 
While this all sounds a little grim, the joke at our house now is that if the Vikings are playing and they're losing, Jack turns the TV off and says he's going to the lab. My dad loved the outdoors and from an early age was very proud to be an Eagle Scout. He was always identifying wildflowers, trees, and weather patterns. It was important to him to expose his children to certain outdoor adventures as well. And when Kathy and I were teenagers during the summers, where my dad was collaborating in different parts of the country, I remember Berkeley and Aspen, he would take us, Dan was too young, on multi-day overnight backpacking trips in the nearby mountains. Later, Dan, with Dan, they would sail and ski. To this day, my brother's happy place is sailing on large bodies of water. My father loved spending time at our family cabin in Avoca, Wisconsin, which, unsurprisingly, had humble beginnings. It was basically a two-car garage with no plumbing. But over time, and much to my mom's credit, expansions and improvements were made, and it became a warm, inviting, restful retreat, the source of many great memories. He made much of the furniture, and we all have permanent scars on our lower legs where the bolts were sticking out of the beds. <laughs> he did forestry, which is also known as cutting felled trees with a handsaw for firewood. Um, and he tended to the garden in red. But there was no TV, of course. But there was an internet connection, so the lab was never out of reach. My parents often entertained family and friends, always with good food, provocative conversation, and evenings spent looking at family slides, at slides of the family, or competitive games of Scrabble and Monopoly. When the grandchildren were there, my dad was always eager to take them to the swimming hole, play a game of catch, have an epic water fight, in the, and in the winter, take them sledding. While many of you may not be surprised that he loved to hike, canoe, and sail, you might not be aware of his equal enthusiasm for making snow structures, trips to the beach, fireworks, water guns, amusement parks, and water slides, especially water slides. The higher, the steeper, the better. I can still see him, arms crossed, legs tight, plummeting down this wet cylinder, shooting into this pool, finally stumbling to get up, hair and shorts askew, with a smile of pure joy on his face. He did this well into his 70s. And aptly, his favorite water slide was called the Black Hole Super Whip. After 50 years of marriage and mourning the death of my mother, Dad was ready to embrace changes in his life. His second wife, Carol, was a welcome respite after the emotional toll of caring for my mom for over five years and she introduced him to many new experiences. Dan, Kathy, and I felt it must be love as Carol got him to go to a Rolling Stones concert, a casino, and the racetrack. But several years into his new freewheeling life, another family tragedy struck. My sister Kathy was diagnosed with a rare aggressive form of leukemia. During what was the last month of her life, May 2011, my father was in New York and by her side, day in and day out. He was especially close to my sister, sharing many interests, music, travel, books, Russian literature, and current events. And I think in some ways, my father never really recovered from the loss of his firstborn. After her death, a certain joy was missing from him. His dry sense of humor and easy smile were less prevalent, and he seemed to revert back to the simplicity and quiet 
he sought for most of his life. I suppose for him, it was a way to find comfort after unspeakable heartbreak. Since his death, we've received many wonderful notes and are grateful for the kind words and remembrances. It's clear from these tributes that my dad was not only respected for his technical abilities, but also greatly admired for his character and unassuming nature. He was a humble man, and despite significant scientific accomplishments in a variety of disciplines, the one constant over the course of his lifetime was his quest for an uncomplicated life. My, pa my father's passion for simplicity at home was a perfect counterbalance to his passion for the complexities of life at the lab. Thank you. It's a privilege to speak at this celebration of Jim Cronin's life. Angela has asked me to talk about Jim as a colleague and as a world leader, and that's what I'll try to do. Jim was a dear friend for nearly 30 years and a close scientific colleague for over 25. It's been a marvelous experience knowing and working with such a fine person. I haven't actually seen him for 15 months because he hasn't been too able to travel, but I had actually planned to be here in Chicago this week with my wife to celebrate his 85th birthday. We spoke on Skype practically every two weeks. But what's really annoying is that we've not had a chance to discuss Donald Trump and Brexit over a few whiskeys. Jim, I really think you might have waited. We first met in 1986 when Jim decided to move from working on particle physics to work on cosmic rays. When he wrote, Asking to visit my group in Leeds, he mentioned that he'd been in Yakutsk in the USSR, where he'd had the same interpreter that I had had when I'd been there a couple of years before. Following the collapse of the Soviet Union, when Luba, the interpreter, was in financial difficulties, Jim and Annette regularly sent money to support her. This was my first example of seeing Jim as an exceptionally generous person and as someone who at heart was an internationalist, a facet of his hat character that was of great importance to the success of the Pierre Auger Observatory. Jim was a great Francophile. In 1964, he started a sabbatical year at Saclay, and like many native English speakers, he had assumed that as all physicists spoke English, there was no need to learn French. However, he was advised by a Hungarian, Janos Kirs, that it was essential to learn French so that he could interact easily with technicians and engineers in the laboratory, but also so that one would come to understand the people and appreciate the culture of France. Accordingly, Jim and Annette took intensive courses at the Alliance Francaise while Cathy and Emily were enrolled in French schools. And according to his recent uh, biographical right, autobiographical writings, after three months, the family were reasonably fluent. This language skill was of huge help in the promotion of the Pierre Auger Observatory in France. I also vividly recall Jim talking in French with Pierre Auger's daughter at the groundbreaking ceremony in Argentina in 1999. However, I have to say that Jim did not develop the same language skills in Spanish. And although he visited Argentina, Mexico, and Spain many times, I think Dos Cervezas Por Favor was about Jim's limit. As well as learning about the physics of cosmic rays, Jim took great interest in the history of the subject. History generally was one of Jim's passions. He quickly learned how cosmic rays had been used by other Nobel laureates, including H. Compton from the University of Chicago, particularly in the 1930s and 1940s, to develop science in economically poor countries. And as the concept of the Auger collaboration developed, the idea of involving less advantaged countries in a large international project took root. In 1994, Jim approached the Director General of UNESCO, Federico Meyer, to ask for support, and he extracted $100,000 largely used to bring scientists from countries such as Armenia, China, Russia, and Vietnam 
a six-month workshop at Fermilab. To me, this achievement was utterly remarkable. Jim got the money from UNESCO at a time when the USA was not even a member of the organization. However, I'm sure that Jim had briefed himself well and did not lose the opportunity to point out to the director that Pierre Auger had been in charge of the Department of Mathematics and Natural Science of UNESCO for over 10 years. But this is only one example of Jim's determination to get what he needed to pursue physics gold. At the age of only 29, while at Princeton working on the spark chambers, he wrote to the head of IBM, Thomas J. Watson, requesting that IBM speeded up the delivery of the company's card punch so that he could get decisive results from his spark chambers before groups in Russia and England succeeded with their more antiquated techniques. Jim, although exceptionally modest, was very competitive, whether it was in physics, playing cards with him, or on the putting green at St. Andrews. Jim seemed to relish having to jump hurdles. In 1994, we went together on a trip to the Far East, visiting six countries in 21 days. We visited Vietnam. At that time, the USA did not have diplomatic relations with Vietnam, but he got special papers from Washington. We were very nervous, but we needn't have been, and we quickly met the vice president of the Communist Party, who turned out to be a theoretical physicist who'd been at Dubna when Jim had gone there in 1964 to promote CP violation. The Vietnam trip was particularly successful for the development, first of all, of cosmic ray physics in that country, with much training of students, particularly in France. And then, after that had really served its purpose, it has led to quite remarkable flourishing of a group of astrophysicists working on stars and planet formation in that country. Because of the discovery of CP violation, many projects were triggered across the world, often by Jim himself, to study rare decays of kaons. There's now a community of thousands, particularly in, Ch in Japan and the USA, working on derivative experiments. Jim was responsible for building international bridges between scientists in the USA, Asia, and Europe. After Argentina was selected as the host country for the observatory, Jim attended over 20 meetings there to push the project, spending a lot of time with President Menem. He also had a huge impact in bringing Mexico into the collaboration, making repeated visits to meet with the Director General of CONICET and with Vice Chancellors of the key universities. In fact, the Pierre Roger Observatory is widely seen as a model of international collaboration now between about 400 scientists from 16 countries. And its success has led to other developments in some of these countries that might not have emerged so quickly, even if at all. In Argentina, for example, there's now an Institute for Astroparticle Physics in Buenos Aires. In Malargue, the home of the observatory, there is the James Cronin School dedicated to, dedicated to the visual and performing arts. Jim gave personal money to this school to supplement the major donation from David Granger, a, a Chicago businessman. The impact in Mexico paved the way to the successful proposal to host the site of the Hawk Project, a joint Mexican-US initiative in gamma ray astronomy, and for a new program of scientific networks that started in 2009, which led to unprecedented collaborations between Mexican institutions. I've only been able to say a little of Jim as a colleague and a world scientific figure. Jim, you will be greatly missed as a family man, as a dear friend to many, as a hugely important figure in physics and the international scene, and above all, as a man of great generosity, humility, and modesty. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, um, all the speakers and all of you who are uh, are sharing these moments with us. I asked our organist, uh, the university organist, to play one of Jim's uh, music. I think you learned it, right, Thomas? Yes, uh, just especially for Jim. I hope you will recognize it. And while he plays, you're welcome to join us next door at Ida Noise for a luncheon. Thank you very much. <laughs> 